coming up on this episode of Here's an Idea. Quite often you see these same robots um, in automotive commercials making sparks. In this case, there are no sparks in candy production. One of the things I love the most about candy, it's not even just the candy, it's all the design elements. It's a really cool experience to like see your face on a candy bar. Eugene J. Candy Company, a small shop in Bushwick, Brooklyn, has its share of freaks. This is a bin called Experimental Freaks. And so I, I used to call this bin the jerk bin. You know, you used to be called jerks. You, know? you got your nerds, I got my freaks, and then these were the jerks because they were the ones that I was trying to make and it just didn't come out right. This is Eugene. Eugene owns and operates the candy store, making all kinds of candy on location behind a big purple curtain. This is where he turns the jerks into freaks. He even lives upstairs. Freaks, like he says, are similar to the popular candy known as nerds, except the freaks are much bigger and bumpy in texture. I consolidated the naming because people were coming in here for the jerks and didn't know about the freaks. In Eugene's shop, he gets to experiment. One day, he may want to make a freak. The next day, he may want to make something even bigger. One of the things I read that recently is the uh, the super freak. So it's like this, uh, the freaks are bigger than the nerds. The super freak is, let me see if I can even find one for you. It's like um, it's kind of ridiculously big. And it's like the size of maybe a quarter in diameter or something, you know? Yeah. Kind of looks gnarly. I tried to do a black center on it to see what that would do. It just kind of like darkened the shade. I thought like... um. A black core might be good since this is an all black uh, exterior candy store, you know, trying to like stick with a the theme. But um, yeah, I didn't know what would come out, so now I know. <laughs> Eugene has plenty of ideas. And when you run the whole show here in the shop, you can bring those ideas to life. On this particular day when we visited in Brooklyn, Eugene told us he had lately been inspired by the story of Willy Wonka. Um, in the book, Dick Gruber is accused of plagiarizing the invention of the non melting ice cream. The ice cream doesn't melt in the hottest heat of the sun. So I thought the thicker grew bar could be uh, waffle cone pieces inside, like tied back to the book again, you know, and waffle cone pieces and milk chocolate. You can get a taste for Eugene's creativity just by taking a look at his candy offerings. Freaks, super freaks, milk chocolate Cheerios, or the dark chocolate cornflakes he gave us that day. They were delicious. I like the most when I don't have a recipe ready and I can just go in there and just mess around and come up with, it's just like a six to eight hour process. So I have a lot of time to just think about ideas to try out, you know? And so while I'm doing that, um, it's a lot less pressure. I don't know what I'm doing, but I can strike gold or I can come out with something that's not ideal, but at least I learned from it, you know? Eugene is used to this kind of trial and error. He's a former engineer. His first job was in green manufacturing for a countertop company that makes recycled glass surfaces. During that time, Eugene was still managing to make candy, an extension to his love for baking. After work, he would tweak recipes. His bosses even encouraged him. At that time, the bosses were all like very nurturing, and they even suggested maybe I wanted to keep like one foot in like Candyland and one foot at the at the factory. But I just kind of made a big leap. So whether you're making candy or countertops. Experimentation is the name of the game. But the big manufacturers like Hershey, Nestle, or Mars want to mix things up too. In this episode, we look at how manufacturers, large and small, are turning to innovative production ideas to give candy makers the flexibility to make whatever they want. We'll talk to an engineer who designs the candy sifting robots inside today's factories. We'll talk to a scientist who found a faster way to make gummy bears. And we speak with a journalist who has the sweet gig of covering the candy manufacturing beat. So, here's an idea. Candy. Eugene's current candy experiments revolve around panning, a process of putting a candy shell on, well just about anything. You could put chocolate over peanuts or an M&M shell or M&Ms or Skittles or whatever, you know? Or like grow a grain of sugar into a jawbreaker. And you know how in the jawbreaker you see all the layers? That's pretty much what panning is. You're just adding layers, except with a jawbreaker, you just do it over days or weeks. So with panning, your candy shell is often a sugar, like sucrose. Eugene's freaks 
use dextrose. The pinning may also call for chocolate, and each syrup could have a different viscosity or concentration. Eugene's candy laboratory is somewhat of a mystery. We didn't get to peek behind the curtain, but here's what he told us about what's back there. Maybe think about like a cement mixer or like a, a spherical bowl on a shaft that's just spinning on an angle. And that's the uh, that's on a uh, drive shaft that can control the speed, you know, so I can make it go really fast or can make it go slow. So I have it rotating at a certain RPM and um, next to it I have like a, um, a hot plate with some syrups maybe going held at a certain temperature so that it's fluid enough to cover everything but not cold enough to let everything crystallize again. Major manufacturers have bigger equipment, the kind that can't fit behind a curtain, or even in Eugene's store. The Hershey's, the Nestle's, they can afford robots. Here's Dean Elkins, segment leader for the Material Handling Group at robotics manufacturer Yaskawa Motoman, based in Ohio. You know, the robot industry, and, and Motoman in particular, were involved in really the front end of candy production through the back end of candy production. We're involved in uh, the picking of candy, the placing of candy, the cutting of candy, the case packing of candy, ultimately the packaging and palletizing of candy. All of those applications are becoming much more prominent in the manufacturing front of, of candy today. When we're talking about picking and placing candy, it's hard not to think of that famous scene from the show I Love Lucy. Have you seen it? In the days of I Love Lucy, you had actual people like Lucy and Ethel handpicking the candy, and in one of the show's more memorable moments, not being able to keep up with the speeding conveyor belt. They can't keep up with it, and they start having to consume candy and put it in their hats and, and hide candy so that they didn't lose their job because their boss was a bit of a taskmaster. With today's vision technology and sensors, robots are keeping up with the high speeds of candy flow as it comes down the conveyor belt. So what you would wind up with if you didn't have that stuff would, would be a, a big mess on the floor at the end of the conveyor line, which is sadly a, uh, a loss of candy and, and dear, dear profit. So um, I think you'd be surprised to, to see how far um, that technology has come and how easy it is to implement in a, a very short period of time from a, a robot industry history perspective. Take licorice, for example. The candy is made into a tubular shape. It's then left to dry on drying boards. After it's dried and cured, it's then automatically removed from the boards by a special machine with a stripping wheel on it. Once the, the candy is removed from the drying boards by that wheel, it actually is uh, deposited onto a conveyor and actually moved to a location where a robot that's equipped with five, six, or seven different sets of fingers pick up portions of the candy in a very portion-controlled method and actually place the candy on a flow wrapper where it's packaged. Once it's flow wrapped, it continues down the product line where another robot case packs it uh, based on the portion control aspects of the case and ultimately palletizes it and places it onto a skid where it's moved into the warehouse for shipment to retailers. You'd think an international candy manufacturer would want as many hands as possible on their candy. Not necessarily. The big players like Hershey and Mars, and they make a ton of brands that we eat, and they are constantly bragging about how hands-free the process is. This is Crystal Lindell, editor of Candy Industry magazine. Candy Industry is a trade publication that covers exactly what the name suggests. The global candy industry, from manufacturing to retailing. Kind of like tech briefs, but for candy. Crystal gets to travel a lot, to conventions to see the new candies, and she goes to the factories. She's seen the speed of robots firsthand. I was just in the Smarties factory, actually, and, you know, they say the complete production of the Smarties candy is hands-free until after it's packaged, which means no human beings are touching it, which they look at as an advantage because it's better for food safety, food quality, and things like that, and there's less contamination risk. And, you know, you're seeing them using robotics wherever they can with packaging and, you know, sorting and things like that. And they also brag, their entire factory is obviously not hands-free, but they also talk a lot about how hands-free the process is and how few people are interacting with the actual product. To be hands-free, you need robots. There are pick-and-place robots, which swing horizontally to find, say, a piece of chocolate, take it off the conveyor line, 
and place it over on a new station, where it can then be cut into a desired shape. There's the deltoid robot. It sorts the candy. The deltoid has four carbon fiber arms mounted on a base that's placed overhead. The deltoid's carbon fiber arms move freely below that base and typically move in a circular fashion or from left to right, finding candy at a high speed. Then there's the case packing robots, which are more industrial looking. The Moto Man case packing robots have six degrees of freedom with large arms for handling pallets. Here's Dean again. Quite often you see these same robots um, in automotive commercials making sparks. In this case, there are no sparks in candy production, um, but they articulate vertically. So they bend just like the human arm as if you were going to be curling a dumbbell. Like with many manufacturing processes, Robots have found their way into the candy factory because they perform the repetitive tasks, the picking, the placing, the palletizing. So workers don't have to hide food in their clothes, I Love Lucy style, as they whiz down a conveyor belt. Robots are being employed pretty much across the board by manufacturers of all sizes to fill labor needs, says Dean. As candy is being produced in so many forms and at higher rates of speed than ever, we need to have faster robots, ones that quickly tell the difference between different products. We need to have robots with really good vision capabilities that can discern small differences in, in candy designs or, or form factors to get them into the right packages. We're starting to see um, flexible, much more dexterous hands put on the robots or grippers, if you will, to accommodate the varying form factors of the packages that have to be manipulated and placed into the right types of shipping vessels. Candy manufacturers are not running the same product on the same line over and over and over again. Rather, they're meeting the market demands of, of their customers. That requires them to have a requirement to be far more flexible in their manufacturing processes, and robots have to do that. Same with the packaging responsibilities once the product is made. They literally get dumped a variety of products, especially around holiday time where robots have to be very, very flexible in being able to quickly change over from product mix to product mix to product mix, depending on the demands of the retailers that are selling the candy. And if robotic technology keeps improving, it's going to be getting to the point where the manufacturing processes will be more adaptable, where the manufacturing will be able to literally design a batch of product by recipe. You're going to be able to flow data down to the robot relative to where the robot needs to pick product and place product and how much of it it needs. And it's really going to continue to get more and more simplified as, as time goes by, especially with the innovations that are hap happening today in artificial intelligence and deep learning. Robots are becoming much more able to do uh, many, many tasks without a high degree of, of reprogramming which is really going to simplify the, the entire manufacturing process as, as we move forward. When you're making candy and need to make as many peanut butter cups or Snickers bars as possible, you have to be thinking about speed. One way for a factory to pick up the pace is, of course, robots. I was actually just in a Hershey factory, their factory in Hershey, Pennsylvania. You're going to see them pushing everything as far as they can with technology. Here's Crystal Lindell from Candy Industry Magazine again, who has seen firsthand how Hershey can wrap their famous Hershey Kisses. You're seeing them really push like their packaging technology to the edge on how fast they can wrap, you know, kisses. They wrap those kisses like so quickly on the line and they have the materials that they use are exactly calibrated to like push through that Hershey Kisses wrapping line as fast as possible. Another way for candy manufacturers to speed up manufacturing is to eliminate steps, or entire processes altogether. For this kind of example, we turn to the gummy bear. Traditionally, to produce a gummy bear, jelly is placed into a starch mold. We have a tray filled with starch. You stamp into it to give the cavity or the shape of the product. And then you can deposit into the stamped uh, cavity. This is Sandra Link, product manager at Bosch Candy Technology in Germany. Bosch produces the technology to make the gummy bears. And if you want to change uh, the shape, you can just like change the printing board to have another shape for, uh, for the jelly. That's the traditional way how you're doing it. By stamping the starch, 
You can give a gummy any shape you want. A worm, a fish, and of course, a bear. When you are eating next time a gummy bear, please take care of all the, the shapes and all the details they are doing because each company has different uh, special uh, uh, attributes. So, for example, we have a laughing, smiling uh, gummy bear uh, and all this stuff, and it's a really precise uh, shape that you have. But there's a problem with using starch, even if it can provide precise, smiling shapes. Everything takes too long. Traditionally, after a jelly mass is produced and is stamped into the right form, the jelly needs to be dried. The drying process takes three to four days. So you can see why manufacturers who want to crank out as many gummy bears as possible in the shortest amount of time might want to cut down on the starch. And also, it might explode. Here's Crystal. There's a lot of safety concerns around the starch molding process because if you do it wrong, it's an explosion hazard. <laughs> so... They're trying to find ways to minimize the need for that kind of for that ingredient in the gummy process. Starch is a combustible dust that can start a fire if not handled properly. For the sake of speed and safety, jelly manufacturers are turning to silicone molds as a way to replace starch. The syrup or jelly is deposited into the silicone rubber. No more trays or starch or stamps. After depositing the prepared jelly mass into the molds, the molds go into a cooling tunnel. And instead of several hours or days, the jellies take much less time. Here's Sandra again. In the new process, the jelly is uh, ready in a few minutes instead of two days. So it's, it's much uh, faster. And yeah, as I said, you do not have the topics like explosion, uh, cleaning uh, effort, and so on. The gelatins don't need to be taken off the premises to dry. That also saves time. The empty molds can be filled again and again, an advantage for the big companies that Bosch supports, the kind of companies that need to, and can, produce several tons of jellies in one hour. It's depending on, on the customer, of course, but you have like uh, up to uh, six and a half tons uh, an hour, producing jellies an hour. And uh, depending on the customers, there are a lot of customers who really produce 24 hours a day, like over 300 days a year. So we need a lot of uh, people eating the jellies. Another way to speed up production without having to buy a bunch of robots is 3D printing. As reporter Crystal Liddell covers the candy beat and makes her rounds to various conventions, which seems like a pretty great perk, she sees 3D printing of candy demonstrated frequently. Crystal says that 3D printing is an exciting area to keep an eye on. A few years ago, Hershey had a 3D printer at the Sweets and Snacks Expo in Chicago, and you know you could have like your name printed or your picture printed on the chocolate. I've had that done. It's really cool. Um, and then in Europe, a company called Katis, K-A-T-J-E-S, um, they were doing 3D printed gummies, so they could 3D print in you know, all different shapes. They can print faces and stars and, you know, rainbows or whatever else you can think of. And they can make those gummies in like three to 10 minutes. And so that's just, it's something right now, like where if you can go into a boutique shop and have candy 3D printed, that's working really well. I haven't personally seen it being used where like, you know, Hershey is doing online orders for 3D printing or Mars or anybody like that, where you can you know, have it done at a mass level. But I think as the technology continues to evolve, you're going to see that more and more. And it's, it's a really cool experience to like see your face on a candy bar. So 3D printing is also playing a role, not just on the candy bar itself, but on the production equipment that is actually making it. The additive manufacturing method allows candy makers to adapt to changing needs and new candies that appear on the line. So if you have a box of chocolates and each one is shaped differently, if you have circles and squares and Rectangles. That means if you have a robot packing those fragile candies into a box, it has to have a different arm for each shape. So anytime you launch new shapes or you want to package a multi-box, like I said, then you have to have a different robot arm. And so that's where 3D printing of parts is coming into the candy industry. Because if they want to launch like a star shape, instead of ordering a new robot hand from Europe, they can just 3D print it in the factory, and then it can pick up the star shape. 
For a candy maker, or a maker of any product for that matter, customization is important. Anyone mass producing anything wants a level of flexibility to be able to modify products as needed. 3D printing allows manufacturers to adapt. But customization is even possible on the factory floor itself. With virtual reality, candy manufacturers are able to make tweaks to their manufacturing processes before they're even implemented in the plant. So something that I think is really cool from that factories are doing is that they're designing their factories using virtual reality. And so you can create an entire candy factory and walk through it and check and see like if the line is going to work or if things are fitting where they need to be. And, you know, if the packaging line is in a good place compared to where they're, you know, finishing or cooling the chocolates. And that is, it's kind of like a video game. And like, you know, I go to conferences and I get to put the goggles on and like walk through factories that don't even exist. And it changes the ability of the companies to create a space without, you know, spending a ton of money to really get a feel for how it looks. Customization is important to candy makers, all the way down to the packaging. Maybe you've seen this on a Snickers bar. One wrapper might say hot mess, another might say hangry. This kind of variety is possible because of digital printing. It uses digital printing like from a computer to quickly print different sayings or different recipes on a package, um, but they can run the entire thing through the printer. So they can run, you know, 50 through, and the computer knows that every, you know, 50th package has this recipe on it, or every 50th package says hot mess, like on those Snickers bars, and it can change while it's running through the printer. For smaller candy makers like Eugene in Brooklyn, the joy of candy making does not necessarily involve the technology. And sometimes it doesn't even involve candy. One of the things I love the most about candy is not even just the candy, it's all the design elements that come up with it. So, you know, I have these like wax sealed bottles, you design the wax stamp, you design the sticker label, you design the name and like the logo for it. That's what I like the most. And so um, part of my day, while I'm working the store, I have a lot of time. So I spend a lot of time just kind of like creating the store, you know, like all the decorations are it's really just kind of like DIY, like off the cuff. Maybe to distinguish themselves from the Hershey's of the world, a lot of smaller manufacturers take a more traditional, handmade approach. There's the other side of the spectrum where artisan chocolate makers pride themselves on a lack of technology, using antique technology, using hand wrapping still, hand sorting for the cocoa beans. Um, You're seeing like the Mast Brothers are a Brooklyn-based artisan company that uses, they brag about their antique wrapping equipment on their website. And like they do handwork at Vosges still, like for their champagne truffles and things like that. And so that's kind of like the pendulum swinging all the way back in the other other direction and consumers being willing to pay a premium price for basically candy that's made with a lack of technology. For every larger manufacturer using virtual reality, 3D printing, or robotic arms, there's someone like Eugene, someone in the back room panning, adjusting, (laughs) making experimental freaks, and coming up with new ideas. Um, so we can move further down this way, and this one I just started at the end of last year, so I'm tweaking around a lot with. It's a, um, collection of cereals, like Corn Flakes, Cheerios, and Rice Krispies with dark chocolate on it. And that's always a good combination. I just put a, uh, novelty candy shell on it, and if we go a little further down, I got two more. Um, so this bin with the milk chocolate Corn Flakes, I thought the dark chocolate is great, but then I changed... This has been an episode of Here's an Idea. This episode was written and produced by me, Billy Hurley, Kendra Smith, and Peter Bonavita. For more information about the technologies featured in today's podcast, you can visit our episode page at techbriefs.com slash podcasts. Here you'll find pictures and interview transcripts from our episode. Our podcast page also gives you an opportunity to subscribe to our Here's an Idea newsletter, which provides photos, facts, and follow-ups on the technologies and technology creators featured in each episode. And we want to hear from you. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts and send us feedback to podcasts at techbriefs.com.